I, I, I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common, and that is we both assumed the gun was empty. Your emotions are so clearly so right there on the surface. You felt shock. You felt anger. You felt sadness. Do you feel guilt? No, no. I feel that there is, I, I feel that, that, that uh, someone is responsible for what happened, and I can't say who that is, but I know it's not me. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. Okay. How is everybody? Happy Sunday. Wanted to talk to you today about Alec Baldwin. Now we've been hearing a lot about Hannah Gutierrez Reed because the armorer and certainly a lot of the press has been hammering home this idea. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with Alec Baldwin and his well-moneyed PR team that Hannah Gutierrez Reed, the armorer, it was her job all of the responsibility for the assistant director, Joel Souza's injury and Helena Hutchins' death is squarely on the shoulders of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. And I'm not buying it. Certainly, she was derelict in her duties, but we have to remember that Alec Baldwin was the producer. He set the tone. I had a professor in college, and I was asking her, she was telling me that she always did redid her lessons plans, reread the material even if it was the same thing that she had done last year and the year before that. And I said, why do you do that? And she said, because I'm the professor and my students are only going to work as hard as I do. So in the same spirit, Alec Baldwin was the producer and he set the tone. He decided how he was going to pay people, how he was going to treat people, what kind of emphasis he was going to place on safety on his set. And we've heard the reports. People quitting over safety issues the day before Helena Hutchins. Death. So we're going to look at his police interview today. Quite shocking. But before we do that, I want to get into your comments from the last time I talked about Alec Baldwin. This is from KJ Bro 838. When I saw when I saw this last year, it ran through my mind over and over. The conclusion I came to is that Alec Baldwin is not going to admit any guilt because he is avoiding any culpability. So when he heard the word guilt, he immediately denied it. Yeah, I think you're right, KJ. Thanks for the comment. Jennifer McIntyre, who's a member, thank you, Jennifer, says, I have a very hard time being objective about this 
because Alex is so dislikable. Raging narcissists have very fragile egos and can't stand being disrespected or questioned. Sorry, I had to cough. If he goes to trial and takes the stand, he will have a hell of a time controlling himself with people questioning his integrity and his culpability for the injury and death on his film set. His father was the coach of the shooting team. Interesting, Jennifer. I didn't know that. Of course, his father taught him gun, gun safety. And you'll see in this interview, he's very aware that he was part of his part in following gun safety rules. He, he gets right at it in the beginning of the police interview. Marisi 811 says, while certainly not intentional, Alec pointed a gun at and killed a woman. Unbelievable. Excuse me, I had a cough. Unbelievable. He convinced him he, he can convince himself he's the victim here. Gary Beck says, couldn't finish watching after five minutes. In due to your constant commentary, people don't watch for your commentary. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that, Gary Beck. All right, shall we get into a little a little commentary that people don't tune in for? <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, either of those, I thought he was coming with you, so... So there's like a little audio interference here in the beginning. So if you have your headphones turned way up, you might want to turn them down just a little bit. It's just in the beginning here. Detective on the case. And can we get you coffee or anything? Okay. We'll be in here in just a minute, okay? So I'm just going to move a little bit forward to his, to when he talks to his wife here. So the actor is preparing the scene. He's got everything he needs. His water is. Can you hear me? His phone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All I can think of is Kyle Dunnigan that comedian does such a great imitation of Alec Baldwin. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's like a parody almost of Alec Baldwin, isn't it? Hi. I'm at the police station of the sheriffs and they're about to interview me. Um Hola. Hola. It's your fake Spanish wife. <laughs> Hillary from Boston. Are we cos I mean, it's like they're full time 24 hours a day cosplaying at a whole different ethnicity. <laughs> she is. How is everyone at home? How are the kids? The kids are great. The kids are great. Did you um, tell did you hold on a second, please? Did you tell Carmen what's going on? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, are you convinced you don't want to come tomorrow? I mean, I don't think it's a good idea. Look, look, call me after you talk with the sheriff, but, like, I don't think it's a great idea. I think, I think, I think this is, you know... No, but let me, let me just say this to you, just, be clear, just to be clear. They're going to make me stay here tomorrow anyway to talk to my insurance investigators. This is really... I'm going to talk to you more, but I'm just saying... I'm so sorry. You must have such, like, you must be so charming. No, 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 what I am is someone who... I don't want to do this for anymore. I don't. I don't want to be a public person. And, you know, I'm the one... So he doesn't want to be a public person anymore. So it's like a child having a tantrum. My reckless ways got exposed on a set. I know I'm going to be under the fire for this. I'm going to take my toys and go home. And his wife, Hillary, says to him, you must be so traumatized. 
just let us remember that what happened on this day is that Alec Baldwin took Helena Hutchins' life. And some of this, someone could argue, is that he's an actor, he's used to, he's used to this, but he certainly, he says, he's disagreeing, saying, no, I'm not traumatized. What I am is, and you'll see the words that he uses. Holding the gun in my hand that everybody was supposed to have taken care of. They always hand me a cold gun. Where, where are you now? Michelle, who? Well, and where are you? Okay, all right. All right, I'll call you back when I'm done, okay? So now he, it sounds like he's talking to someone who is either a friend of Hillary's or someone who works in the home there. Now he's going to convince Hillary that she should come to New Mexico because they'll have such a good time and it's all paid for. So really open up your ears and listen to this part. It's amazing. <laughs> Hey, where are the kids? Kids sleeping. The boys are sleeping. Yeah, Did she tell you what's going on? Yeah. I'm trying to convince her. I'm trying to convince her to come. I think we should come. They just yeah. spend the time here, and they're going to do what they got to do with the deal, what they got to do with. And we shouldn't let that. We will go. We will go. I won't work, and we'll go into her. So it's all paid for, and they're not going to give us the money back. Okay, if you didn't just hear that, he said, we will enjoy ourselves. It's all paid for. And welcome, Chino3613, become a member. Welcome aboard. Thanks so much. It's all paid for, and we'll have such a good time. He doesn't want... The fact that he just ended a woman's life to get in a way with a good time. Come on, guys. It's all paid for. What? So a cinematographer, his friend, quote unquote, is deceased. Don't let that get in the way of his good time. It's amazing. It's the the callousness is off the charts. We should be staying away from the vultures here. Are they outside? No, but I imagine they will be at some point. They're I think it's a great idea. It's a great idea. You should come for that reason also. All right, I'll call Carmen on her iPad, okay? Okay, yeah, she's on her, she's on her phone. I'm very sorry, actually. Oh, yeah, you, have no idea, you have no idea how unbelievable this is and how strange this is. And I'll explain to you later. Sorry, you're in this position. No, no, it's just... I hope everyone... Okay, just a question for the audience. Would you be saying it's strange and unbelievable? You just killed a woman. I would I would be saying, I don't know how I'm going to be able to live with myself. The guilt is eating me up. Why didn't I check? How could this have happened? What went wrong? What, you know, how can I ever do anything again? Instead, he's saying, I don't want to be a public person anymore. <laughs> I mean, if he connected that with, I, I don't know how I'm going to act anymore. I don't know how I'm going to go on the stage. I don't know how I'm going to ever get over this. Instead, it's just very, it's very strange and a uh, surreal experience. Sure it is. All this is new to Alec Baldwin, not talking to the police. He's been arrested before, surely, and convicted. He's had a terrible time with the press, getting in physical altercations, 
And then uh, the last time I talked about Alec Baldwin, I played a clip where he called a, a member of the press a gay slur. And it was a huge crowd of press and then denied it, said, I never said it. So when he's caught in these situations, so when people said, and I got comments that Hillary Baldwin and her hoax that he joined in with and pushed had nothing to do with this, I say it has everything to do with it because that is his MO. When he's So when he was caught with a gay slur, everybody who heard it, they all misheard because I didn't do it. With Hillary Baldwin, we all know she's really from, from Boston, but consider the source. The press is to blame. Nothing we did was wrong. And here, with this, I didn't pull the trigger. I would never point a gun at someone. And then if you saw, he had a quote, you never point a gun at someone. This is what he said, unless you're told the gun is uh, is empty. That's his new safety rules. Oh, hey, Manny, nice to see you again. I love his wife's accent. Cucumber. Cucumber. How do you say cucumber? I'm doing her French. Uh, do you, you can tell I, I took French. Did you know she's from Spain? <laughs> yes, I hope Alec lands a lengthy sentence. Me too. Hey, Manny. He's definitely responsible. I, I dealt with Hillary Baldwin a lot in the last episode. And I'll return to her because I think it's really an important part of his psyche. When he's caught doing something, his first instinct is to always to say, I didn't do it. Everybody else is wrong. And he supported so many killers. Heyman Lee's killer, Anan Syed, Teresa Hallback's killers, Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, and and Officer Faulkner's killer, Mamiya Abu Jamal. All, all those are innocence campaigns that Baldwin has all hopped on. Saying that you're okay. Uh, I'll call you back. Thank you. Bye bye. He's also defended his good friend Woody Allen, had him on his podcast and has visited with him. There's a great piece of video where he's in front of Woody Allen's brownstone with his wife, Hillary, and they gets into it with the press there right after this shooting uh, of Helena Hutchins. So he has no problem <laughs> defending some really deranged and dangerous people. Hi, Samantha. Don't you think he loves seeing two women walk in the room? I just always have the feeling that Alec Baldwin isn't isn't too into women too much. He doesn't like them too much. So, no way you're here. <laughs> uh, for this incident, that uh, was... Unfortunate earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you already agreed to talk to us and everything, and that's great. Um, we're just gonna go over the rights. She's gonna read these to you um, as you understand them and just sign an initial. And then, uh, if you read the bottom and agree to talk to us, you sign each of them. as you understand them. Yes. Yeah. So first one, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in court or other proceedings. You have the right to consult with an attorney before making any statement or answering any questions, and you may have him. Cheney Garn Garnet forty four two says, "I wonder what kind of relationship he has with his daughter from his marriage to Kim Bassinger." My understanding that's the one he called a rude little pig, and my understanding is that they've parried it parried made a parody excuse me of that if you watch the roast of alec baldwin which would be fun to do sometime 
it's his daughter that he said was so horrible. He said the whole thing, which was interesting on Howard Stern. Alec Baldwin said the entire roast was difficult to sit through, which I give him a little bit of credit for admitting it. Most celebrities will say it's hilarious. I loved it. I was a good sport, but not Alec Baldwin. <laughs> he said it was devastating, especially his daughter. Ireland, who read every bit of what the comedy writers wrote for her. Were her present with you during questioning? You may have an attorney appointed to you to represent you if you cannot afford one or otherwise obtain one. Um, if you decide to answer any questions now with or without a lawyer, you have the right to stop questioning at any time. Yeah, that, the voicemail is one of the things we know how Alec Baldwin reacts when he feels slighted with, with incredible anger, venom, violence. So I'm of the opinion that this accident was an accident. Did, do I think he knew there was a, a live bullet in there? No. But did, was he, you have to think about what he was doing at the time. He had to be imagining play acting. He cocked the gun and pulled the trigger. It's a two-part motion. So he must have been in a fantasy of doing it. And if you've seen the evidence in Hannah Gutierrez Reed's trial, he hit her right in the chest with a bullet. What kind of accident is this? It's, it reminds me a lot of the Twilight Zone accident with John Landis, which is something I'd love to talk about. I think it's a lost part of history. It was one of Los Angeles's longest, most expensive trials. John Landis will still say that was an accident. It's kind of like saying uh, there's something wrong with Aunt Diane Schuler. <laughs> I'm thinking there's something wrong with Aunt Diane, that documentary. Diane Schuler, that was an accident. Yes, it's technically an accident, but an accident married with great negligence. Barb Nauman, thank you so much. Alec fights continual feelings of inadequacy. Very interesting. And low self-esteem. When he's cornered, he rages like a bear, but it's all BS. He's a pathetic figure. A hundred percent. Very insightful, Barb. Yeah. And I'm I'm looking at him and I'm almost feeling sorry for him. He's comical and pathetic. He's almost like a cartoon of narcissism. <laughs> but, but then I stop myself and get in reality. It's like my dad used to say, you know, um, when I really didn't like someone and they were giving me a hard time, he would say, they would have to, they have to be that person all the time. And I'd say, but dad, they don't realize how awful they are. They're not, <laughs> they're not suffering time or stop questioning for the purpose of consulting a lawyer. So my only question is, am I being charged with something? No, we're just interviewing. Yeah. I don't, that's why I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not worried because I'm not, yeah. We, we have to do our job at, yeah, no, just tell me that at advising you, you your right write because my name this here? is an investigation. Yeah. Just a formality. You have to do, do it. You're here. You do appreciate it. You do it. What is today? It is the 21st of October. Oh. Long day. Well, what's interesting, not to digress on some commentary here, is that we've done this for two weeks and we did it the right way every day. Every day. You're on a set, you rehearse, they bring you what's called a cold gun. The gun is either completely empty, the chambers, or there is a cosmetic piece. So, for example, if you're the camera, and this is going to sound silly and specific, but if I'm pointing a gun close to the camera, you want to see into the cylinder that there's material in there, mm -hmm. cosmetic material. So those rounds are cosmetic rounds. Mm -hmm. They put them in and you rehearse, mm -hmm. or even in a shot when you don't fire. Mm -hmm. I pull the gun and you see there's some material inside the cylinder. They'd hand me so my understanding is that this was a marking rehearsal. There was no need. So my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was no need for this cosmetic 
element that he's passing over in this interview as a must. There was no need to have bullets in the gun at all. And he contradicts himself in about a second and says, well, they're, usually the gun is empty. So first he's telling them that it's absolutely necessary that there, there be bullets in the gun, and now it's not. A cold gun, no charges. They always hand up a cold gun with nothing in it to rehearse. And then <clears throat> when you shoot, and if you are shooting loads that are flash loads, and they're usually in three denominations, quarter, half, or full load round, so that the flash is bright mm -hmm. and the sound is loud, louder, loudest, full load is loudest. So if you're outside, you want a full load, bang, you want a loud sound, or inside, you can do a quarter load. Right before you shoot, everyone preps, group. Yes, Tia, I did hear that, and I almost, I almost covered that, but I thought we'd start at the basics. So Tia's asking if I heard, it's just been released, there's a phone call with Alec, and he babbles on. Oh, hey, Tia, are you a Daniel Johnston fan? I, I've i been a Daniel, Daniel Johnston fan. For, I actually got to meet him. I have a piece of his artwork that I got for $20, <laughs> I think, or $10 or $20 back in the day when he performed here. He babbles on and on and repeats like Charlie Adelson. Sounded like he slipped at one point and said, I try to keep my finger off the trigger. He tries. Does he try not to cock the gun too, Tia? Yeah, it's a crazy phone call. We'll get to that, Tia. Thanks for bringing that up. Put the earplugs in, so put headphones on. The camera's there, very open as a loose sight screen. But you're the camera operator and there's the camera, so I should always shoot off camera. You never shoot into the lens. And you shoot and there's a flash and a sound. Now, I went to lunch. She disarmed me. I sat she down. She being uh, Hannah, the, Hannah. Guard, the armaments person. I when she was always handling the guns, ninety nine percent of the time. So I would, uh, if I had a cosmetic rifle with no rounds, I'd probably hand it to one of her assistants. I'm sitting there. She disarms me. We go to lunch. We come back from lunch, and they hand me the, the revolver, the, the Colt. And they, I just like the name. It's Hannah again. They they arm me, mm -hmm. and you're assuming, as we've done every time, that it's a cold gun for the rehearsal. And I put the, the, the gag in the shot, you're the camera, because I have a coat, and I have a holster, and I pull the coat over, and I kind of cut my hands like I folded my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to slowly sneak the revolver, the, the Colt, out, and turn and shoot the other guys, or try to shoot them. I take the coat over the thing, I the camera's there. I believe, my recollection is she was there, turned a bit, like talking to him. So her, I think she was hitting the right armpit. Do you notice no one has any other names? It's like Alec Baldwin and not me. <laughs> these people who were not me, these unimportant people, they don't have any names. She, him, that person behind the camera, all distancing language. The little people. The little people. That's what my boyfriend says. The people that don't matter. But this is all I know, and that is that I take the gun out in the rehearsal. Really, he wants it very dramatic and very slow. I'm trying to sneak mm -hmm. up on them. I take the gun out, and as I take, like as it clears, as the barrel clears, the whole turn and cock the gun in rehearsal. I turn and cock the gun. The gun goes off. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a cold gun. Nothing. No flash charges. Nothing. Now, this is a puzzle to me. And this is making me very emotional now. You know. But, in my time, and I'm older now, but when I was younger and I was shooting guns in the field, I've never seen a theatrical flash round where the material went through someone's armpit, came out their body, and hit somebody else in the shoulder. Yeah. I'm wondering if... He's not sure, ha having heard this giant sound of a gun firing, he's not sure if it was a real bullet. He's still confused about what happened, so he's pretending he's confused. And John Schneider, the actor from the Dukes of Hazard, and I have his video lined up if we get to it today. This is awfully long, but maybe I'll show a little bit of it. He he argues that you cannot not know that you've just fired a live round. It is impossible to know that you just fired a live round. Impossible. 
So this is a little bit of acting we're seeing here. If your department is prepared. And when he was, you know, he's reminding them how old he is, that he's seen everything and he's been around guns. Don't know if that argument helps him. You go find out what comes out of his shoulder surgically. Is that a live round? That's what we are actually looking is at. Is that a lot? Because I don't, does make any sense otherwise? Really? Yeah. It hits her in the armpit, comes out her shoulder, goes into his shoulder. And he just told me on the phone, I talked to Joel. He said, they showed me the x-ray and the shape of the thing in my shoulder is the shape of a bullet. Now, all the rounds I was told, you need to verify that this is important. They take the gun, they have to do it, and all the rounds that are in there were either dummy rounds, no flash, cold rounds, or rounds with a flash. In the rehearsal, there should have been nothing. It should have been a cold gun with no rounds inside or dummy rounds, cosmetic rounds, no flash. I take the gun out slowly, I turn, I cock the pistol, bang, it goes off, she hits the ground, she goes down. He goes down, screaming. He said, Jesus Christ, and I'm going. And I thought that maybe sometimes the wadding can come out if you're closer to get a burn. Two actors who killed themselves. My boyfriend is wisely pointing out that the kickback from the gun alone would alert you that you just filed or fired, excuse me, a real gun. And Jerry Griffin saying he was calling Donna. Donna? How do you get away with a murder? Listen, I'll tell you, Alec, how you get away with a murder. You, you're charged with murder? I got a great lawyer for you. His name is Daniel Rashbaum. Write it down. <laughs> Funny. That was with guns, with theatrical guns, John Eric Hexham and Brandon Lee. They put the live right there, and I'm told even with the flash powder, you can cause contusions and you can do a brain, brain bleed and die, which both of them died. Right. I think with Brandon Lee, there was a, 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 a piece okay. of material lodged in the thing that shot from the or something. Yeah. I don't remember vividly, but my point is, I've been doing this. I this is really good police work we're watching here. Just let him talk. Let him talk. Just nod along. Let him talk. But he's saying that he knows that Brandon Lee was killed by a blank so he knows the danger even of a blank so he should be following gun protocol and having been in this business even longer he's had all these safety trainings what was he doing why why did he choose to do business in this manner someone might ask I shot enough guns in my day in movies I've never seen this before or a flash round, but from my understanding is, can I borrow your pen for a minute? My my understanding is that in a in a in a bullet, you know, here's the thing with the pin, and here's the the, the bullet itself. And now here, when you have a cosmetic round, no flash, no nothing, they drill a hole in the side of the brass to show to signify that it's a cosmetic round. There's nothing in there. There's no powder. And when, but when you have a when you have a flash round. And you have to, and, there's, and there's stuff in there, wadding and powder to make the charge. This material here, that is the bullet, is made of a clay or some material that just disintegrates. So what you have is bang, and you see the flash go bang, and you hear the sound, but nothing, there's no projectile. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about is what. How much would you love to see that piece of artwork he just drew for them? And thank you, Tia, for, yes, I've seen that mural. That was the, one of the things I wanted to see when I was in Austin. We'll talk later. <laughs> we'll talk later. I'm a big fan. It came out of that bullet that went through her body and into his shoulder. That's pretty powerful. I, 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 I've never heard of it. Now, some people say <coughs> you can lodge material in the barrel accidentally, a rock, something, that happens, which is why she... Every time we've done this, I'm here to tell you, to testify that every time we've done this, she's done it right. She cleaned the barrel, made sure nothing was lodged in there. We went hot when they were ready. It was announced, going hot. Crew gets ready. And then. Okay, so listen to d the different explanations he has for how they communicate. The gun is cold. So he just said, right? He just said she did it right. So he's putting, already putting the blame squarely on the Amherst. She did it right. But did you check 
this time to make sure she did it right. So every other time he checked, but not today. It was done correctly. All of a sudden, you're the camera, and I shoot away from you. I sit there, like, bang, 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 and flashes are coming out. We shoot the rounds. She cleans the barrel every time, and she checks the, that the rounds are all cosmetic rounds for, or nothing in the chamber for the barrels. She hands me the gun. I'm assuming she's done it the right way. She's done it the last two weeks. I put it in the holster. I pull it out slow. We're rehearsing. We're not filming anything. I pull it out slow, turn, cock the pistol, bang, it goes off, and she hits the ground. And then he starts screaming. And I'm thinking, in a flash round, I could see maybe if there was wadding or there's some stuff like that, that's hot, and maybe it hit you and burned you. And then they say sometimes mm -hmm. that happens. But remember, we're rehearsing, so no one's protected. So it's all supposed to be this one. This is like saying the building See, there appears to be flames coming from the building and smoke. It's almost as if the building were on fire. It reminds me of the time that the building was on fire. People are screaming, but I'm not sure what's happening. Or, or, nothing. or nothing. For the rehearsal, the gun is normally empty. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is that they were standing in positions they wouldn't ordinarily be in because they assumed it was an empty, cold gun. We weren't shooting, we were rehearsing at the vital difference. So if she's here, if the camera's here, and she's standing here talking to the gun, and I'm on a bench here, and Joel's behind her, and this guy, this is not proportionate because obviously the camera's not as big as her body, but I draw the gun slowly and aim off camera, and there's supposed to be nothing in there. So she's not protecting herself and standing off I'm shooting in a direction, and everybody is supposed to be to that side of the camera. There's nobody in my line. Nobody. And so when I shoot the gun, so in the rehearsal, I'm assuming I have an empty gun, and the gun goes off. She's right in front. Oh, it's her fault for walking in front of him. There was no one in his line a second ago. But she walked in front, right in front of the gun. It's her fault for walking in front of the gun after he cocked it and pulled the trigger. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Imagine being in the head of Alec Baldwin. And there was a, another great quote where he said, normally it's all taken care, care, <laughs> care of for me in the beginning of this. So that's the life he's led as an actor. Everything's taken care of for him. But this time... He wasn't taken care of correctly. And then Helena Hutchins had the gall to walk in front of the gun. She walked in front of the gun. Oh, this enrages me. Mm -hmm. She's as far from me as I am from between, the difference between maybe you and the door. Okay. So pretty close proximity. It was, just a very, it was a very tight shot. Okay. The shot was here. Of me, not of me, it's of me pulling the gun slowly, so it turned cock. Okay. And she's right there, vulnerable, in a position she wouldn't ordinarily be if we were shooting. And, she, and this thing, boom, yeah. she hits the ground. Okay. All right. I'm going to back you up just a little bit, yeah. okay? Yeah. How long have you been on set? I arrived uh, Monday the 11th. Okay. Yeah, so I agree with the people in the chat saying this, this contradicts the story he tells in the interview. In the interview, he's saying, I was showing her the gun. It is a bizarre section of his interview with Stephanopoulos, where he's saying, I showed her the gun. Oh, is that right? Is that the right angle? It's, it's so bizarre. It's almost like a little challenge. And my theory around this, and this is just a theory based on Alec Baldwin's Vermont interview where he talks about very briefly, he skips over it. First, he really wants to impress on the press that Helena was his friend and that they, and to prove that she was his new friend, they had all gone out to dinner the night before. And wouldn't that be the perfect opportunity to say, we talked about our kids. I learned about this. Of course, he can't remember a thing about 
not anything not Alec Baldwin said at that dinner, I'm sure. But what happened at that dinner? I think something happened. Because why else would you be cocking the gun and pointing at someone? And just remember the day before, Alec Baldwin told the crew to get out of line of out of the line of fire of the gun he was pointing. I said, I don't want to point a gun at you. So what happened between the day before when he didn't want to point a gun at anyone and the next day where he's cocking the gun? I'm not even going to go into, was his finger resting on the trigger? So I don't think it matters. <laughs> I think the, the key element is that he cocked the gun, he pointed it, he knows you don't do that. You don't point a gun at anything you don't want to destroy. That's gun rules 101. And for those, that's, for those that are saying in the comment section, I don't think Alec Baldwin should have been charged by New Mexico standards. This fits fits the actions of involuntary manslaughter. It's negligent manslaughter. Did Alec Baldwin intend to kill Helena Hutchins? No, but my point is he must have been having a fantasy of doing it, of, of he's pointing, cocking the gun, pointing it at them. Rehearsal hadn't even really started yet. So what are you doing? You're play acting. You're having a fantasy. I believe she slighted him in some way. Either she disrespected his authority and pushed against something he wanted to do, or maybe he made a a pass at her. Who knows? I can't. I can't know that. It certainly hasn't come out. Maybe we'll find out in trial what happened at that dinner or what the situation or what the relationship was between Alec and Helena at that period. But certainly the set was reaching a boiling point. People were quitting, walking off the set. It was not a happy set at this point. And Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was getting paid a ridiculous sum for her work as an armorer. These are long hours hard work, and she had other responsibilities. They had doubled up her job with, with other more like gaffer type job on the, on the set. $8,000, a little less than $8,000 she was getting paid. I started my fittings and my, they were already were shooting the week before. And the 11th of October. Monday the 11th, I flew in from New York. I flew from New York to Denver, Denver to Albuquerque, because there's no direct flights there, and then drove from Albuquerque to here. Okay. Rehearsed and fitted and did all my preparatory stuff. But so that was in October, correct? That was Tuesday the 12th, yeah. I flew on the 11th, rehearsed on the 12th, started shooting the 13th, Wednesday the 13th, that's what shooting. Okay. We shoot a Wednesday through Sunday schedule. We're off Monday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So the entire time you've been on set, have you seen the same armor? And her crew, yes. Yeah. Everybody. How many people are on her crew? Uh, my guess is that what I witness is three. Okay. All young women. Hannah and two other women. All right. And very often their task with me, because we're not shooting every day, guns, we're not, there's no armor. I'm shocked that he knows her full name. I wonder if he had it in his notes. I wonder, I'm just shocked because I used to work uh, as a D girl for Danny DeVito's company, Jersey Films. And we shared offices with Universal. We had a deal with Universal. And the woman who worked at Universal had worked as an assistant for Harvey Weinstein and he never learned her name. He used to call her Dum Dum. <laughs> to her face and she would laugh about it. I mean, just, he was so uh, notorious for being just absolutely uninterested in, in who he hired there. Every day. They dressed me with my holster, my knife, 
were, the, the film was set in 1888, so I'm armed with the classic weaponry of the cowboy era. Okay. And so they would make sure I was dressed properly. You know, 80, 85% of their task is to make sure I'm dressed with everything properly. The armorers? The armorers. The armorers. Well, the armorers, wardrobe doesn't necessarily, they sometimes trade back and forth, but wardrobe doesn't necessarily deal with my holster. Okay. And, and the knife, because that's a prop. The armorer, Hannah, and her team, they dealt with me being knifed and that being lashed properly, so it looks proper. Okay. And the uh, uh, holster. Okay. And so it was wardrobe as much as it was props, as much as it was armaments. Okay. Do you know no. Hannah's last name? No. Do you know what she looks like? Or can you describe her? Yeah, uh, multicolored hair, glasses, uh, you know, uh, not too tall. Everyone knows her pretty well because her father is a very famous armaments guy. He's a guy that did guns in movies for decades. He's very well known. That's why he knows her name for her father. And strangely, the film business is like this. If you have a family member who has been successful, you will it, you will gain a little bit of that kind of respect from their name and you'll be a little bit more important on the set. So that's how he knows her from her father. So I was shocked that he knew her name. Okay. She's the daughter of this famous gun guy, movie gun guy. And what about the other girls in her career? I don't remember their names. Okay. Do you know what they look like? A blonde, thin, not too short, you know, kind of medium height, and brunette, someone on the shorter side, maybe the same. Just say, not Alec Baldwin. <laughs> not me. I refer to them as not me. I just have a brunette and... Uh, and also, there's a there's you go back and forth between. They're wearing a mask most of the time on set. They've right. been ordered to do that, but I've seen them with their mask off. Okay. <laughs> All right. What time did you guys start today? Yeah, I'm a good guy. He also mentioned his kids a lot. He starts this interview out mentioning his kids, so he's gonna virtue signal. I'm not just a father. I'm just. I know I'm a famous movie star that you've seen in such films as a working girl. You might have seen me on Saturday Night Live. What else has he done? Oh, he's done so many films, right? But I'm just your average everyday father, just playing with my 17,000 kids when I go home at night to my fake Spanish wife. I don't know what time they started. I came in slightly later because they had a couple of shots without me in the morning, so I came in at, uh, I guess I arrived there at like about... Quarter to eight. Okay. Normally I'm there at like 6.30. All right. And then anything abnormal in the day? Who handed, or should I say, who handed you your weapon in the day? Hannah. Handed it. Okay. And physically handed or put it in the holster? Handed it to me. Okay. She would show me the gun. Okay. Or she'd say, cold, get cold gun. She'd say, test it or some language to indicate as she handed me the gun, then it was fine. And she'd say, do you want to check? Okay. And I always didn't want to insult her. I said, because we never had a problem. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm good. So, and the first AD very often will ask, period. You're too young to have seen me in Glengarry, Glen Ross. But I've also been in 30 Rock. Does that ring a bell? The uh, TV show 30 Rock. Excellent, excellent, excellent television program. What else has he been in, honey? Uh, you, you, uh, Long came Polly. Someone's mentioning in the comments. That was just a bit part. That was just I came on and just did a little bit of a part for them. That. Periodically, he'll say, "Let me check." Okay. And they'll have two people check for this very reason that we don't have any flat. For Do you have the gun in custody? That's what I'm concerned. <laughs> this gun is very dangerous and it's loose. This gun is out there. It's firing on its own. It could, it could fire and and hit anyone. If it could happen to me, it, it happened to me. It could happen to you. Very concerned that you track down this fugitive gun. Think about live rounds of bullets. Do we have any flash rounds in the gun while we're rehearsing? Because if someone wants to indicate, and they're not thinking, they pull the trigger on the gun. You just hear the hammer. The the, the the dead sound of the hammer hitting, and, and you have 
no flash rounds at all in there for the rehearsal. The, the, re the rehearsal gun should be empty. Okay. And, 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 and as I said, for the two weeks I've been shooting, it has been empty. We haven't had one problem. And you ha have you physically checked that, or just by? She announces to me that it's that's, that's clean. Okay. She'll say, "Cold gun, we rehearse." Then when she's done, she takes the gun, goes off. So it says, "Cold gun, we rehearse." Cold gun, we rehearse. Uh, Barb, I thought he might have been in the hunt for Red October, though I've never seen it. Thank you. Someone else is, uh, Ross is saying Malice is a good movie he was in recently. Good. Yeah, his heyday was certainly the 80s and 90s. I'm trying to see what he's been in recently. Elizabeth Town, that big flop for, uh, what's his name? Who directed Almost Famous. He hasn't done much since Rust. Uh, yeah, a bunch of movies I've never heard of, but Crown Vic, Motherless Brooklyn, Stars Born Remake. Okay, all right, we get the, Thank you. Yeah, he really hasn't had such a successful career, but he certainly has enough money to buy a $17 million mansion in the Hamptons. I think that's it's in the Hamptons. To a corner. She has a kit, like a zip fanny pack with her... Uh, uh, elements in there. She puts the flash rounds in there. She'll say, you know, uh, uh, quarter load, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lower sound. Or she'll say full load. And if I'm shooting, if you're the crew and you're shooting me close, you know, if I say the full load, it is rather loud. It's very loud. Okay. So she's always announcing what's going to happen. All right. And she's been very good about that. Okay. So have you guys, backtracking a little bit on this, um, you know, because she's telling you what's in these guns. Um, have you guys been practicing with those quarter loads, the full loads, all that through the past couple weeks? Or have you shot with them? I came in on Tuesday. That's what I did Tuesday, okay. the 12th. I came to the ranch, rode the horse. I just got used to that. And uh, cause they have a double who really rides in the distance up really fast. And all the athleticism you see in the armor horse, and they cut to a watch, and another guy riding was a little horse. Okay. Have quite a crew of them. So today was not the first day that. No, I shot okay. on Tuesday the 12th with the uh, uh, the uh, Henry, the, the, the lever, uh, you know, arm action lever, uh, the lever action rifle, okay. and the pistol. I just shot both. Okay. And, she was there. all right, moving back forward. What time did you guys break for lunch today? Usually, uh, I think today was day we broke at 1230. Okay. And who took the weapon at that time? Hannah. Physically took it? Always from knows. Rarely do the other ladies, the two other women, handle the pistol that were that's live shooting in the scene. As I said, I... Lee Riley, I see your chat. Thank you for being a subscriber. Appreciate it. Nice to see you here. I have the Henry in my hand as a prop. I'd be running through the scene, but no, no bullets, nothing. When they say cut, I could hand it to the blonde girl. Okay. okay but whenever we were interacting with somebody where rounds were going, I keep thinking of Kyle Dunnigan in his imitation of Alec Baldwin, where he says, I can't remember Hannah Gutierrez Reed's name. I am i can't see any woman over 140 pounds. <laughs> it's so, it's so, it's so accurate. <laughs> it's so accurate. I don't know. And he calls them girls, which is just something that irritates me. Are we talking about someone under 18? No, probably not. Can we just call them women? Can we get to that? Can we can we move past this girl thing? To go in the gun, you would have flash rounds in the scene. We shot flash rounds. It was only Hannah. Okay. Only. With her fanny pack with the rounds in there, her equipment. Okay. Um, do you know what time you guys got back from lunch? I guess it's 1.30 by the time we all get back to the set up. Uh, there's a base camp and there's the set. Mm -hmm. So we go to the base camp for lunch, and they always just drive back, get their wardrobe touched up, get their hair touched up, and make up whatever we do, and then we're on set. We'll about an hour before we go back on the set. Okay. And was Hannah the one to physically hand you the gun at yes. point? Okay. Um, during the time that you had it, was it ever handed off to anybody else? No. Okay.
did you see where she got the gun from? No. Um, she has a station somewhere with all her stuff. Okay. The, the elements and the gun and a cu couple different guns. Guns for the other actors and she gets all the guns. Is anybody else allowed in that area? I don't know, but I know that on this, I, I've never seen anything that was out of the ordinary. She had like a, sometimes they have a, a cart, like almost like you use like a hospital catering, and I have like a big plastic tray, a dark plastic tray, two levels and wheels. Um, I think that's what she had, but many of the departments have that, and uh, on that tray would be her, or something like that. I don't recall what exactly hers was, like. but they have a station that they bring to the set okay. for her to put all of her stuff in the, uh, if the weather. You know, really important point that I haven't brought up is that he barred the armorer from the church, citing citing pandemic rules. They didn't want too many people in there, but it will give you an idea of how he thought of her job as not crucial, even in a scene, even, I mean, they were just marking a scene. But even every time he has a gun, the armorer should be there, is my understanding. So I think this would be a good time to take a little bit of a break. Let me just make sure I know where I am and show you, we'll come back to it, show you what John... Schneider from the Dukes of Hazard had to say about this. This is from his channel. Once we're live here on YouTube, uh, I was about to start my new podcast called Don't Get Sound is not great here. My apologies, but let me know if you can can hear it. I'll try to try to even out my sound, try to turn down my sound me started um, but I guess that's what this is so I want to hear from people I really I truly I, I want to hear from you out there right now there's nobody listening there's nobody watching but I want to hear from you what you think about this latest nonsense um, Alec Baldwin to give first in-studio interview after Rust shooting with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Well, first of all, George Stephanopoulos is the poster boy for leftist propaganda. So why in the world anyone would look at an interview with George as being anything enlightening or having a modicum of truth, I don't know. But that's just me. Okay. This journalist has walked the party line since he showed up at the party's front door. So, it says here, uh, sat down Tuesday, it was raw, it was intense. This is all designed to make us feel sorry for Alec Baldwin, especially this. Um, as you can imagine, Stephanopoulos said, he is devastated. But he was also very candid. He was very forthcoming. He answered every question. He talked about Helena. Um, pardon me if I don't pronounce that correctly. Hel yeah. Um, meeting with her family. He went into detail. And I have to tell you, I was surprised in many places over the course of that hour and 20 minutes we sat down yesterday. This is investigative journalism, okay? So you can see he's saying, oh, thanks, Lee, for the super chat. Thank you, Roberta. Who and when and how did live billets get on the set? This is the bottom line to me. I believe that they were delivered to the set, but I think that we're going to find, find out a little bit more that Hannah Gutierrez read got them mixed in with the, this is what I've learned so far from her trial, but if people know more in the chat, let me know that she accidentally mixed in the live, a few, I think there were four live, live round, live bullets found, but if I've gotten that wrong and it was um, 
if a round is considered, I get, a round is one bullet, right? So am I right? I don't know guns. Never, I uh, haven't shot guns since I was a child. It sounds so odd, but yeah, I, I skeet shoot it once. Uh, strangely, with the on the director Stanley Donan's <laughs> property of Singing the Rain as a child. That is the bottom line to me and love your channel. Thank you, Lee. So what my understanding is that when you have a blank, it will make a little rattling noise. And so what the armature's job is, is to shake each bullet before she puts them in the gun, he or she puts them in the gun to determine if they're live or not. Many people are, or the state is is suggesting or arguing that she was derelict on her duties of shaking each bullet. So pretty interesting. I mean, I even now I find it hard to believe. It just doesn't seem real to me. This is what Alex said. Okay. Uh, And it was teary eyed. I mean, it affected him so much. It's bullshit. Okay. So, if you, I watched this uh, a couple times, and he actually is tearing up. So, in addition to showing, to arguing that he, Alec Baldwin, could not have known, not known that he shot a live bullet into Helena Hutchins' body. He's also arguing that it's so easy for us actors to bring up these tears. I'll do it right now. And I watched this a couple times, and there are tears in his eyes. Wendy Adelson, take notes. She just went for the, <laughs> the, the palms over the eyes to hide her face. But He's saying remorse is really easy for us actors to act and crying. and But I don't even think Alec Baldwin did such a good job of that. Yeah, teary-eyed. Um, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. Okay, This is what we are being told right now. Stephanopoulos says, so you never pulled the trigger to which Baldwin replies, no, no, no. I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them. Never. Okay, are you guys seeing a pattern here? I would never call someone a gay slur. I would never perpetrate a hoax with my wife that she was Spanish if she wasn't actually Spanish. And I would never point a gun at someone and pull the trigger. But if you look at the thumbnail to my la to my one my latest one of my latest Alec Baldwin videos, he's quoted as saying you never point a gun at someone and pull the trigger unless you're told it's not loaded. That's his new rule. Crazy. Okay. This is what we're being told. Stephanopoulos then says, continues, you say you're not a victim, but, but is the, is, I guess they, they wrote it wrong. Is this the worst thing that ever happened to you? Yes. Yep. Yep. Baldwin says, cause I think back and I think of what could I have done? Okay, then you read a little further in. A little further in, it says, Hutchins was shot and killed as Baldwin rehearsed with what he believed to be an empty gun on the set of Rust in New Mexico in October. He was handed the weapon by assistant director David Halls, who had been given the gun by Hannah Gutierrez Reed, the 24-year-old armorer on the film. Halls reportedly called cold gun as he handed it over. Remember, we just heard that, that uh, Mr. Baldwin did not pull a trigger. Okay, now, in the same article, in the same article, as Baldwin then practiced drawing and firing the weapon, a bullet discharged, injuring director Joel Souza and killing Hutchins. 
So what is it, George? Are we to believe that a gun went off by itself? Are we to believe that someone didn't pull a trigger? Are we to believe that somehow magically on the first part of your teary-eyed, nonsensical journalism that we believe that Alec didn't pull the trigger and then? Yes, John, that's what you should believe. There is a gun out there. It's currently a fugitive. It fires. It cocks on its own and it fires. It's a very serious situation. It has yet to be arrested. What? Three paragraphs later, it's described how he did, in fact, pull the trigger and no one calls attention to that? Seriously? No one calls attention to that? This is a wonderful business we all work in. We are um, honored and privileged to be part of it. So when someone takes a crap which obviously George and Alec have done here. And obviously this woman is still deceased. Her family is still without a mother, without uh, a wife. This, this is... A it's, so, it's so right on for the right on, John Schneider here. So right on for the right on. And I love how he calls the George Stephanopoulos interview and the Alec Baldwin, where he, he explains, I took out the gun. I said, is this right? Is this shot right? It's like, the, it's almost like he's describing something like a flirtation. It's so weird. It's so strange. I... Absurd. We are now starting to see the propaganda machine, in my opinion, this is my opinion, I could be wrong, but I'm from New York, so because I'm from New York, I don't think I am, and I'm from one town over from the Baldwin clan. So he's from Mount Kisco, which is not far from Bronxville, where Sarah Lawrence is, where I went to school. But he's like, look, I'm going to tell you how it is. <laughs> Us New Yorkers. Okay. So we're to believe that this man is a victim. Three weeks ago, it was a prop gun. Four weeks ago, uh, nobody knew how in the world this real weapon was loaded on the set. And today, he didn't pull the trigger. What kind of idiots do you take us for? Law enforcement, people who are in charge of this investigation, please do not stop investigating. Please do not believe the prop gun propaganda. And by all means, do not believe the I didn't pull the trigger. Nonsense. Guns do not go off by themselves. Let us not forget this was a single action. It was not a cult. It was a replica. I'm told. I read, right? I read like everybody has read. Um, and there's also this other PR going around that the gun was somehow de uh, defective because what happened was the FBI did these intense tests on the gun to see if it was firing on its own. And they broke it, so they had to recreate it. So Alec Baldwin's PR team went and ran with that and put out stories that this was a defective gun. See? There's still I'm still getting comments about this defective gun, no matter how much I talk about it. A single action weapon needs to be cocked and fired. So what kind of idiots do you take us for? So this wasn't done and this wasn't done and yet the gun went off and fired down? Think about people. Where, where would they have to have been in order for this to happen? Just, just FYI, this is his weird audio. It comes 
comes in very loud for a second, then goes out. And it sounds like he has an old movie projector behind him or something. It's odd. Very odd sound. I wonder what what, what he was up to. Down on the ground, looking up, as cinematographers and directors often do. I've done it myself many times. Aim here. We've been all through that, through that whole thing. But there is no world unless somebody randomly ran in behind. And I don't even think this would work. I'm being a little bit sarcastic now because I'm pissed off. Unless someone randomly came in while Mr. Baldwin had the gun out and hit the thing with a hammer. And even then, I mean, there is no, there is just no world in which guns go off by themselves. So he never. Okay. So I think that's, that's his point. And he's made the point on his channel that even if the gun were defective, it wouldn't matter that it, he believes so strongly. And so does New Mexico law <laughs> that you're responsible when you hold a gun in your hand to check it. It is on the actor to check. There are other actors who, who will shoot rounds into the ground, will fire it, dry fire it if there's nothing in it, just to make sure all the way around. Others use their eyes and look at it, make sure. But if any of these gun safety laws were observed, Helena Hutchins would still be alive and still be caring for her son and her husband. It's and and making movies as a cinematographer. It's revolting. And it's revolting that we don't see this kind of outrage more in our in our media. Instead, you have, and I understand that George Stephanopoulos' job is not to berate Alec Baldwin. But where else is the outrage from, from talking heads talking about this case? For Helena Hutchins and, and her senseless death. It's really, we, we've gotten way out of whack. It's always about the perpetrator. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have warned you guys. RIP people who are listening on headphones. So now the volume is going to be a little bit higher here. But she has a little place she would go to. And I think she has a truck where she stores it. When they wrap, everything goes into a truck and she takes off with it. It's her responsibility to. Uh, secure the prop weapons. Everything in there. Which are real guns. Are real guns. Um, can you actually describe the gun to me? Uh, it's a Colt, a period Colt. Uh, in our emails back and forth when we were prepping the film, she showed me just a couple different styles of guns. This is not a big budget movie, so we didn't have a lot of choices. So he, he can even name the gun. Excuse my voice. He can even name the gun. I mean, I'm so out of it with guns, I, I wouldn't even know. It's big, it's black. <laughs> you know, he picked this thing out. Yeah, you, 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 she showed you three or four choices. I said, give me the biggest gun you've got. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so I didn't, uh, she showed me different guns uh, by email and different knives by email, uh, cruder knives that were made to put, like someone fashioned the handle out of like L corn or things. Like that. I took a traditional knife, a leather strap. A handle. Um, we went back and forth about the holster and the material, and uh, we just had a, a relatively brief conversation. I, I'm having made a lot of movies. I know how not to stress them out about the budget. When she shows me something, I try to make that work. And so uh, she showed. Me, I said, "Just give me the big Colt." We were done. And then on that Tuesday, the 12th, I came and shot that gun. Okay. What color is it? Uh, I believe it's a brown handle because she showed me two of the larger Colts. One had a cherry-colored handle. I want to have a brown handle, and I chose the brown handle. You didn't want the cherry. I could show you my emails in my phone. <laughs> I didn't want the cherry. It was too shiny. Ah, okay. My character's a little bit in the retirement side of his career, so. Ah. He's a retired bank robber. I'd be out in the Wild West. You need the gun to match. 
<laughs> well, you always have people in films. I mean, they go to an extensive extent. You wouldn't believe some films if they have the budget, the details you go into. Of all the things you wear, jewelry, hats, watches, guns, cars. I mean, there's people sit down. I mean, I've made a lot of films, and the films that had bigger budgets, you could spend a whole week going to rehearsal, reading with the director. The writer goes and rewrites. They yeah, he's wowing them with... Excuse me, I had a cough. Wowing them with his tales of movie making and how it's done. Because he wants to remind them that they're sitting with a big star. Do you realize they're sitting with the Alec Baldwin? The Alec Baldwin of such great films as... What didn't he, wasn't he in a film called The Married Man or something like that? <laughs> He's done some some stinkers. Listen to how the dialogue sounds. And then once you're done rehearsing the text. Done some great movies too. And he's certainly um, fun uh, fun to watch on Saturday Night Live. Next, with the director, the producers, and the writer. When you're done reading, they'll go make amendments. But when they hear it come out of your mouth, they'll go, let's change that line. The way Bob says that, and then they go, they go, then you go right to wardrobe, props. You go do a lot of stuff. Okay. All right, so you get back from lunch, get ready, she hands you the gun. Um, was this inside or outside? We inside the church, the church set. And was it the first rehearsal that the incident happened? Yeah, I believe so, because we talked about, as we were going to lunch, we're always talking about what's next. Okay. So as we were rehearsing scenes, he said, now I want to do a scene where uh, we've done other shots before lunch. He said, when we come back from lunch, we'll do this. And he said, I want you to pull it out and show me. Because I was showing you what I thought was the best angle, to see the glint of the gun under my coat. Because you want the scene to work, the shot to work. So where the holster's here, the gun is here, my coat comes around, and I held my hand like it was like I was just cupping my hands, like I was just resting. Okay. And I showed him in the rehearsal. So when we came back after lunch, we rehearsed for the camera, and I took the gun. I really, I'm showing him. I'm going. I'm going to go like this, like this, like this. Cock and turn. Bang! It went off. The first time. Okay. So it was it was your. It was the very time first time that we were shooting that shot that we were rehearsing for that shot. Okay. That camera shot. Um, and you may, if you don't know the thing, <clears throat> did you? So now the beginning of the story, a little bit different than the earlier story, or, or I guess he would argue or Alec Baldwin supporters would argue, now he's just giving more detail to his story. Like this, like this, like this, goes off. That's the Stephanopoulos story, too. You happen to see, so obviously you guys left from that upper, your upper shooting area to go have lunch. Or did you eat lunch up there? No, we always go back to the base camp for lunch. Okay. For the stage. Yeah, did the, stage. the armors, or did you see the armors go down? No. No. Nor would I. Okay. Well, once they're gone, I'm gone. Okay. Do no, people no. stay up on set, or does everybody go down? Well, there are many people who will forego lunch. Okay. I, mean, I say that back, not many. There are some who will forego lunch because they have work to do. Okay. Some of them will hold them a plate. Some of them will they'll bring their own lunch. They just, many people, they, uh, um, they make sacrifices because of their pride for their department. Mm -hmm. They may sit there and say, I think I need to paint that wall and touch up that wall. I think I need to distress those boots. They all have work to do. Mm -hmm. And very often, a small number of people will stay up top while we drive down from the set to the... So now he's admitting that he... So he's saying, I give them time for lunch, but they're so dedicated to their jobs that they want to work for lunch. For, for lunch. Not that, 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 it, that we demand that they work through lunch. Not that we're violating labor laws. Base camp, the caterer is there in need, but maybe a modest number of people stay up there. Okay. All right. And then I just want to clarify, really, um, I know you're drawing something. All right. So when you had pulled out the gun, obviously you were not at the cameraman, but you had identified there were two people there. Can you tell me who those people were? My recollection is that the operator was there. He's a steady cam operator. Okay. He's a man who there's either a camera on sticks that's stationary, okay. but as a man who operates the steady cam that moves. The camera operator was there behind the camera, and she was to his right. And who is she? That's the one we're missing. Helena, the, the cinematographer. Okay. The camera director. And she was right next to the cameraman. She was to his right, to my left. 
and who is behind her? Joel. And he is? The director of the movie. Okay. Can you recall who exactly was inside at the time no. of the incident? Uh, or uh, Dan, anyone else? Dan Halls, okay. the first AD. He's in charge of the crew. The first assistant director is the man who's like the foreman of the set. He's in charge of all the grips, all the, all the crew. Okay. Electric, cable. Do you know his name? Dave Wall. Uh, Dave Halls. Okay. Uh, Dave Halls is always there. Uh, uh, Helena, Joel, me, the operator, an assistant camera person. The script supervisor, the woman who sits in the corner in some strategic position to take notes on all the action of the take so you can match. If one day you're doing a scene, you sit there and go, what is your first name? Samantha. So they're like, Samantha, you know, it's really important that you and I uh, drink, 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 uh, get together and talk about that case. You drank, when did you, she makes notes so we match every take. That's called continuity. That woman who does continuity, she's always there watching. She was in the room. Okay. She's an older woman, like in her 60s, maybe with, uh, um, you know, that colored blonde hair, maybe, or brown hair. But she, I forget her name now, but she is, so there's a group of people that are always there for every shot, even if you're in a kind of a cramped interior. This set of this church is not large. So then the rest of the crew is outside. In that side was a limited number of people, maybe. Eight, nine, I don't, I don't remember. I, I know that every time they do a shot, those people are always on the set. Camera, assistant camera, cinematographer, director, first AD, script. Okay. So not too many. Very few. Do you think that any part of this incident that occurred was intentional? Well, I, I can only say this, which is, in, in other words, to me, to place a bullet and position a bullet that is a live round to make sure that that bullet is in the chamber if I were to squeeze the trigger in a rehearsal that that bullet came out. Someone has to have extraordinary access to that weaponry to do that. I can't imagine somebody walked around with a round that was a 45 caliber round. So you see other people on the set were speculating that if it was a 45 caliber round, she'd be dead. It would have blown a big hole in her. And so we're wondering, was the projectile that went in her some it would put a big hole in her. Yeah, it did. It did. He still can't figure it out what happened. Did put a big hole in her, Alec. No. Uh, <laughs> my boyfriend's asking if I'm talking to him. No. <laughs> uh, what a terrible, terrible, insensitive remark. That's a, I mean, it's almost like an object, these other people. I know the term narcissism and narcissist gets talked about way too much and applied to people who it may not be accurate for. But in this case, boy, boy, terrible. Foreign material stuff. I mean, it's like a cartoon of narcissism. And it was an accident, it was a flash round. Yeah, Queen Olive says he's so nonchalant. Exactly. This is what I'm just in awe. I mean, what more can you say about this that hasn't been said? And something came out of the barrel. They didn't check. They always check. But... But to your experience with these armor... I've never heard of anything like this in my life, ever. Okay. I've never heard of a projectile coming out of a prop gun that went through a person's body, regardless of being a... Yeah, but it's not a prop gun. You're using it as a prop. It's a real gun. You've never heard of someone being shot? It's like he's in La La World because everything's been done for him. So he, he, he just has to act. But if you're on the set with a gun... you. Your job, there's a story floating around. I believe I saw it on Reddit and take it with a grain of salt. But that Alec Baldwin had 
pointed a gun to someone's head on another set and the armor was told on that set to lock up the guns and keep them away from Alec Baldwin. Is that true or not? I don't know. Certainly uh, uh, something that I'm not basing my feelings of guilt or innocence on. It's just an interesting story that uh, has been floating around. And when you listen to him talk so nonchalantly, it makes it feel like it, may, it might be true, but you don't know. You just can't know. Dee Dee asks, if you believe Alec Baldwin has criminal culpability, well, the jury has to figure that out, decide that, and we haven't seen all the evidence. I'm just basing my opinion on what I know about what is required in terms of gun safety on sets, Alec Baldwin being the producer, Alec Baldwin being the actor, also responsible for checking the weapon. And during his training, he didn't pay attention. But why I, he was on the phone with his wife, he was very consumed with, he didn't like being away from his wife and his kids. No one can like that who's in a happy marriage, what would be an appropriate sentence if found guilty? I'm glad I don't have to decide that. When you go to these sentencing hearings, which I've been to quite a few of them, let's say Nancy Salzman, Keith Ranieri, Allison Mack, Ghislaine Maxwell, Larry Ray, I've been to so many sentencing hearings. It's calculated so specifically. And this is one of my issues with the wrongful conviction movement. It's so carefully considered. And it's a calculation based on, and in New York, you don't have to follow the recommended guidelines. So a judge can give you more than that. But it has to do with, has he committed other crimes? Yes, he's been... He's pled guilty, I believe. Um, I don't know for sure how that, but I, I don't know for sure the charges. I believe my memory of it is, take this with a grain of salt, is that it was some kind of getting in an altercation with a journalist. That's my memory. It may be something different. Correct me if I'm wrong. Please look it up yourself. But that he does have a little bit of a record. That's going to go into his sentencing how uh, how the jury considers and the judge considers his culpability in this. I consider him as the producer, and they set the tone, including the tone uh, around and the procedures, how seriously the set is going to take safety issues. And we know from people walking off that they weren't taking it very seriously. So I'm just going to do a little bit of this. We've been going for an hour and a half so far. I'm going to do a little bit more of this and we'll return to this uh, another day. Smaller woman that, that the bullet went in here, I'm told, went in here, came out here, her shoulder or whatever, and went into his body and buried. I've never heard of that in my life. I don't know of any projectile with a gun in a flash prop gun that could accomplish that. Now, if somebody put a live round in there accidentally... See, a very important question for Hannah is, do, have you ever commingled live rounds with theatrical rounds in your kit? Because they're forbidden to do that. He's telling them what to ask and pointing out at all possible opportunities how responsible Hannah Gutierrez Reed is. They're not interviewing him about Hannah Gutierrez Reed. They're interviewing about his part. But he's going to weave her into the story as much as he can. According to, the, I think, the union rules and the safety rules for all the unions, you're not allowed to do that because of the fear of what will happen that you commingle. So whether someone accidentally and I can't even imagine this, deliberately placed a live round in that gun. Uh, I've, never, I've never heard of that in my life. And I, I don't know anything about what happened, but all I know is when I... See, see the other thing is... Get out, Lisa Mona. 
I'm from the same place in Pennsylvania. Wild. So this is, in a live round, you have a recoil, mm-hmm. usually. When I shot that gun and it went off, I didn't shoot it when it went off. Um, I didn't intend for it to, 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 for what to happen to happen. When that happened is, it, it, I've always told them, because I'm not a gun person, I don't have a gun. They've always told me, they asked me to simulate the recoil. When I shoot the Colt, which is a big gun, 45 caliber bullet, they always teach me when we should be go action. I go, get back here, boom, and they make me take my hand and go, boom. Right. All this talk about Hannah Gutierrez reads substance use, it's certainly being pushed and pushed and pushed. And certainly she has to take responsibility for her part. I don't even know why she's fighting these charges. If I were in her position, I would have so much guilt. I would throw myself on the mercy of the court, ditto if I were Alec Baldwin. But I feel like some of that intense focus on her substance use is is from the Ale- being pushed from the Alec Baldwin PR camp. Just tell it like I see it. That's that's how I see it. I have the kick because mm-hmm. there's no kick in a flash round. Okay. And when I this time, I don't recall there being any kick either. That's important. Okay. Are you? Ex- I know you said you don't own a gun, but are you experienced with shooting guns? Only as much as actors have to be experienced. Okay, which is normally not. Really well, I mean, if you, you do a movie, safety with weapons is is primary. You go off with people. You go off with armaments. People to ranges. I've gone to ranges in Arizona where we shot a lot of guns in a movie many years ago, and uh, you go to a range and you shoot for a few hours, and they teach you how to shoot shotguns, uh, Walther. Uh, So he's really familiar. This doesn't help you, Alec. It's Alec. A-L-E-C. Doesn't help him. Doesn't help him at all. Different, you know, little small guns, uh, James Bond guns, big guns, Uzis, machine guns. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think she was very irresponsible using drugs on the set. But I feel like this intense focus on it comes a little bit from Alec Baldwin's. It sounds like something that might come out of Alec Baldwin's mouth now. Whatever you're using, they make you go and rehearse for hours. And neither of them were tested, is my understanding. The whole day. Oh, they're very safety conscious, as they have been here. They've been very safety conscious here throughout. That's what puzzles me. Well, and have any. I, yeah, and I guess that's more like the question that I'm trying to get out is, you, do you think someone would deliberately do this? I can't imagine who would. Okay. Now, people have said, you know, that six people got fired. So, so he knows as soon as safety issues, the set has been very safe. Everyone, dis- pretty much everyone, except the costumer, who turned out to be putting out total disinformation, i.e. untruths about how many safety meetings that the set had had, said that it was unsafe, and now he's going to talk about the six people who walked off the set over safety issues. And you notice he puts his water bottle right in front of him. And this is something people do in depositions, You'll see them do to create a barrier. And sometimes you'll see lawyers telling them to move it because they know it's a, he's so look at the way his, he's arranged the items on the desk. All he's got a little fortress. He's this is a, a sensitive issue. And so the water bottle goes from the right to right in the middle, protecting him. Because they said that the you know, the union, I don't want to get into a long diatribe about this, but the union, the International Association of Theatrical Stage Employees, IATSE is their name. IATSE is the union that controls all the actors. The Directors Guild controls the director, the Screen Actors Guild controls the director, but all of the crew are controlled by a contract in which those people voted to go on strike against the major studios the major networks, the major streaming services, but not the independent film community. In fact, 
the IATSE rep for the New Mexico contract, because every state has different contracts, was instructed by his bosses in LA, he said, don't go on strike. The strike is against the majors, not against the indie people. And in the indie films, there's six different tiers, I believe, in terms of the contract, how much they're paid. Okay. A bunch of people on the set walked off anyway. So he's going to tell a long story about something else, about another time, not related to his walking off the set. Talk about bearing the lead. <laughs> the lead is everybody walked out over safety concerns. Now it's, hmm, this other thing happened once with safety concerns. And, oh, by the way, six people walked off the set yesterday over safety concerns. You might come across this, what we call a bad fact. Even though they were told not to, to, to strike, they, they struck and they left. And that was yesterday. That was yesterday. That was their last day. And yeah, then the question yeah, becomes, yeah. I mean, somebody said... Well, Oh, okay. So the point is they, they, they were bad that they weren't doing what they should do because they they went on strike even when they were told not to. See, everybody is... So it, it, it makes him look worse, if anything. They were told not to strike and they disobeyed. They were like, you're not here, guys. It's so bad here. This isn't worth dying for. And they left. Page, you're too funny. I got to find your comment. Hold on a second. Paige McLean is saying, this is the first time I've had ever had any sympathy for Hilaria. Hilaria Baldwin. Funny. Very funny. All right. I don't, I don't even know. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, and I was going to, because that was mentioned to me, is that it sounded like it was most of the camera crew that walked off the yes. um yesterday and quit and maybe it, they got fired because they walked off um so the other thing is that the two major people like you said the director um those are the ones who got hurt so with the camera crew and them quitting and then your director getting injured as well as um helena as you don't think there's anybody that had any anger towards them or anything that would want to be I don't know the film? details. I know that one guy, whose name I'm forgetting, he was a very heavy set guy. Okay. He was a very, and lovely to me. And he walked up to me and he said, Thank you for the things you posted on social media in support of the IATSE strike. And he said, I'd like to talk to you privately. Because he said, Because I've got some of my guys sleeping in their car. Mm -hmm. Many of the crew here, because it's shooting in Albuquerque. Is that Lane? Looper, who came up to him, who's the one who's done the interviews, he fits a little bit of that description. And I was only thanked for supporting by this guy who walked off and talked about the dangerous strike conditions later. Boy, I'm sure he's not singing his praises now. He thought he thanked me for supporting the strikers. But you're supporting other people who are striking for bad conditions. I'm telling you, people are sleeping out of their car due to the conditions on this set. And Alec Baldwin, uh, I, I don't, I don't know what happened. I can't. I, oh gosh, I used to know this. What happened? Uh, I don't know if it. I don't think it improved. Did it? Well, it didn't improve enough safety-wise. They all left. We know that. They're in Santa Fe, or Albuquerque-based. They live there. So the drive time uh, is kind of common knowledge in the business that the uh, the unions in New Mexico signed very bad deals in order to attract movie shooting here. They wanted to grow the, the, the crew uh, uh, base here. So they signed the deal that wasn't a good deal when they gave them a 60-mile commute radius. So that means if you live within 60 miles of the set... Mm -hmm. You come to work and you don't get paid any, you have to drive home and they don't hotel you. They don't know in New York it's 30 miles and they have to put you up in a hotel and give you gas money and there's a whole other complicated contract in the, in the more um, expensive markets. Here, this guy was telling me, he turned to me and goes, my guys are sleeping in their car. And I went to the AD and the producers and I asked him, what's up with that? He said, they knew what the contract was. We signed the IATSE contract in New Mexico. And then in the middle of shooting, they decided they wanted to rewrite their deal. They said, put us up in hotels. 
Now, if you put the camera crew up in a hotel, all the other crafts are going to ask you to put them in a hotel. We don't have the budget for that. Mm. That could be seventy five, eighty thousand. Right. So nothing improved. He was happy. This is like these typical Hollywood people. They're happy to virtue signal and support people who are being treated well when when it doesn't affect them, when they don't have to pay. Right. Uh, this is where I think I'm going to leave it for today. Unfortunately, I'm not going to make it through all of it today. Thank you so much for listening. Please hit the thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Subscribe to the channel. Leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. I really appreciate it. And I will be back tomorrow. Actually, I think I'm going to take the day off tomorrow. I really need to get on top of a few things, do some spring cleaning, but I will be back Wednesday at 6 p.m. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you then. Have a great night, everybody.